everyone. My name is John Lustria. I'm the Director of Education at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, which is not where we are today. Um, we're at the Stabler Leadbeater Apothecary Museum in Alexandria, Virginia, and I'm joined by Lauren, Education Specialist here. Thanks so much for, or well, thanks for hosting us. I was going to say thanks yeah. for being here. Yeah, but, our pleasure. But you're, you're always here. Um, <laughs> well, not always, but uh, we're, we're glad to, to be here, and this is a really, really exciting uh, museum. It's, it's got an incredible feel like you step back in time. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely would recommend coming to visit. And today we're going to be talking about Civil War medicine, mm -hmm. which is right in our wheelhouse and yours. Yes, um, yeah. So this obviously was a pharmacy and uh, we definitely want to make sure we get into some of the medicines that they might have given to people. So uh, what were some common Civil War medicines? Well, looking through our ledger books, our account books and prescription book, one prescription book that we have from the Civil War period, opium and morphine right. pop up a lot. Right. Uh, I'm sure they were selling other items as well. We have a prescription um, from that just is listed as soldier, so an unnamed soldier, mm -hmm. so probably was charged right there when the soldier came in the shop to buy it, uh, and it contained quinine. Mm -hmm. And there's also another interesting prescription that we found leafing through the prescription book that's also just um, titled contraband for the name mm -hmm. as opposed to you know listing John Smith sure. and uh, that was morphine primarily morphine mm -hmm. but it also had a little bit of peppermint sure so help the medicine go down yes as all it things were. that we have in our collection mm -hmm. and uh, we're actually standing really close to uh, some of the opium bottles excellent there's powdered opium right up here, okay. um, a mixture of Ipecac and opium, and tincture of opium at the bottom, which is usually, uh, if you're getting liquid opium, it's going to be become, uh, if you're getting liquid opium, it's going to come as tincture of opium, which means it's sus suspended in alcohol, basically. Mm -hmm. Right, right, exactly. And, and that uh, is a good segue. All of these bottles that you see here on the shelves, they are original? Yes, and while this pharmacy uh, started in 1792, mm -hmm. the building was built in 1805, they redecorated around 1850. Sure. So these bottles on the shelves, the fancy woodwork is was all here during the Civil War. Wow. Uh, so if you came in to buy medicine, you're getting medicine that came from these bottles. Wow. Yeah. That, that is wild. So uh, one of the last doses to come out of perhaps some of these were probably dispensed during the Civil War, at least some of them anyway. Well, not the, all. The pharmacy was open for another 80 years. So <laughs> yeah, so maybe, yeah, they maybe refilled it a few times. Maybe that's wishful <laughs> thinking. Yeah, they probably cleared through all their stock over the course yeah. of 80 years. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> they sold a lot during the Civil War, so they probably refilled a lot during the war, too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But that is still very neat that these, uh, and it gets to the whole point, and I'm sure you all say something to this effect a lot, but it gets that suspended in time feeling mm -hmm. because in many ways it kind of was. Uh, and if, mm -hmm. if I'm correct, um, this basically went from being open to not long afterwards just becoming a museum. So there wasn't a lot of uh, ramp up, I guess, from being a business to now suddenly it's a museum. Is that right? Yeah, uh, they go bankrupt, the family goes bankrupt, closes down. The owner actually passes away shortly after he declares bankruptcy. And so a little group of locals uh, kind of banded together and managed to get a few other folks. An ice cream manufacturer from Baltimore got involved and they were able to buy almost all the contents and basically left it here and, and turned it into a museum. So yeah, unlike a lot of other historic site museums uh, where they have to go and collect items right. that hopefully they can find the provenance and they actually did come from that location, these items never left. Right, here we are. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the yeah. ingredients in the bottles are exactly what was there when the pharmacy closed down in 1933. That's, that's really, really neat and, and definitely makes for a special atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Now to go back a little bit, so you're talking about the prescription books and, and people that may have come in and such during the Civil War. Um, and you mentioned you know, someone was just named soldier. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone was just listed as contraband. Uh, how common is that as you find going through the book? I mean, did soldiers or whoever came in typically give their name, or was that common to have that sort of more anonymous soldier listed in there? It doesn't happen very frequently mm -hmm. in the prescription book, so it must not have been that common that they're just recording just soldier. Um, and then if there were other young men that were coming through who were soldiers and they gave their name, it's going to be hard for us to, to know if 
they were just a guy that happened to live in town sure or a military person right so you just have you know kind of a book full of names and medicines mm -hmm. and you know there's no specific reason why you might suspect or at least not suspect that you know this is a soldier or a citizen yeah. it's just it's just a name yep. One nice thing that they uh, recorded with the prescription books, because they're you're bringing your prescription in as a customer, and then the staff here, the pharmacist, is gluing the prescription into the book, and they write the date on it, mm -hmm. and um, they often, and then they write the name of the person, and uh, looks like they probably write the uh, amount that they were being charged as well. Gotcha. And so all this extra little information in addition to the actual ingredients in the medicine itself. And nowadays when we think of a prescription, mm -hmm. it's the name of the prescription and the doctor gives it to you, you take it to the pharmacy. But back in the 1860s, your prescription was a recipe for medicine. Sure. So these prescriptions list uh, the amounts of each ingredient that they, the doctor wants the pharmacist to mix up for you. And uh, they used a different um, form of measurements back then. Right. And so you see all the, the symbols for the old fashioned pharmaceutical mm -hmm. measurements, which is, is fun. Right, a drams, isn't drams yeah, a, yeah. a key word there. Yeah, um, yeah that, that's great. Uh, yeah, very, very much like, uh, much, much more of cooking than mm -hmm. I'll take that off the shelf yeah. kind of uh, <laughs> kind of situation. So one of the prescriptions that you, or well, several of them that you mentioned, you, you mentioned that opium was a common mm -hmm. factor in there, and, and that serves to underscore an important point with Civil War medicine and, and just how common opium was. I think one of the things that tends to surprise people is that during the Civil War, they're actually pretty good at pain management, mm -hmm. which, uh, again I think takes people by surprise because of the prevalence of opium and morphine and, and painkillers and mm -hmm. things of that nature so just the fact just that you were saying I mean we say it's commonly given all the time but hard proof one of the most common ingredients in the prescription book just opium you know mm -hmm. it's all over the place uh, now to get into some of those other kind of specific ingredients I mean say a bit more about quinine what was that used to treat what was that made up of mm -hmm. and Talk a little bit more about quinine. Uh, quinine comes from cinchona, uh, mm -hmm. which is a tree that's native to South America, and we've right. got lots of bottles on the shelf, so mm -hmm. we know that they were dispensing it often because the kind of the size of the bottle lets you know they're going to need a lot of it, sure. and it also shows up in the prescriptions a mm -hmm. lot. It it was today we think of it as a treatment for malaria, right. the parasite outbreak that is malaria, and. Uh, quinine will fight back the parasite outbreak, and it's also a fever reducer. While in the 1860s, they would have used it to treat malaria, whether or not they accurately had diagnosed malaria, they were using it often for a fever. Sure. So you're, you have an infection because of your wound. There's a good chance that they're going to give you quinine just as a fever reducer. Right. That, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, now, another, uh, I think, fairly common Civil War medicine was mercury, mm -hmm. um, and, and I know we, we've been talking about blue mass, which <laughs> is one of the ways it was distributed. Um, maybe talk a bit about blue mass as well as some of the reasons that mercury might have been prescribed to somebody. Well, mercury was sometimes just a antidepressant. Mm -hmm. um, somewhat famously, Abraham Lincoln there was you pick, prescribed pick it. right up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's going to make you feel great. Um, <laughs> And then for venereal disease, it's probably mm -hmm. most famously um, remembered for being a primary treatment for syphilis. Sure, gotcha. And we, ha we don't have any mercury left in the museum, but mm -hmm. we definitely have containers for blue mass and labels for blue mass for uh, primarily pills. Mm -hmm. and, and it was called blue mass, I think, because it was kind of whipped up with a number of other things, and it was this kind of weird spongy, almost Play-Doh-esque texture, is that right? Well, pills probably were often um, kind of... A bit moist. Yeah, they were, because you make a dough to make a pill, yeah. not, not like a tablet, like a lot of folks, we use the words interchangeably nowadays. Sure. Um, so I have read, because I've never actually played with mercury. <laughs> Which is good. I'm a little good. too young for that. <laughs> uh, but that the, the silvery quality of the mercury is mm. largely what gave it its blue color. Oh, I see. But... Again, I'm not a, a one. I'm not an expert on mercury since I haven't gotten to actually use it. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and I think that kind of um, that that lends itself to the whole idea of these being recipes. They're literally mm -hmm. almost making dough um, yeah. for for some of these. And and with the way that pill rollers work, we have. Uh, 
at least I think one original in our museum. You probably have some pill rollers. Yeah, here, I would we think. have an original one that they actually used here. Oh, very cool. And we also have another one that is antique, but we leave it out so that uh, when we give tours to visitors, we can mm -hmm. do kind of demonstrations, at least show them the basics of how it works. A couple other great ingredients that we have on the Ooh, shelf yes, thank you. are chloroform and ether. Oh, yes, classic. So, yeah, chloroform and ether were certainly being used by the time the Civil War begins. Right. And we've got some jars just up here right behind you on the wall. All right. Uh, and so they would have been selling a lot of chloroform and ether to the military for surgery. Now, now, they're not selling that directly to individual patients, is that right? It's more, much more to hospitals and doctors? Or as, maybe, maybe they are? As far as we can tell, yes. Okay. And of course, chloroform and ether uses anesthesia during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's your standard uh, National Museum of Civil War Medicine guarantee. Um, oh, chloroform and ether were used as anesthesia in over 95% of mm -hmm. Civil War surgery. We can't do a video without throwing that statistic <laughs> out. Um, and, and here's one of the places where hospitals may have gotten that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think it's worth noting, we've talked a lot about individuals coming in. Uh, coming in here, getting um, uh, medicines and such, uh, but it's not just individuals coming in here. It's being uh, sent off to hospitals mm -hmm. or, or doctors specifically. Um, there's a variety of different types of clients. Yeah, so there. this was a wholesale druggist even sure. before the Civil War began. Mm -hmm. So they were well set up to then be able to supply the military with ingredients and, and other items. Like they sold them ink. Mm -hmm. and kerosene, uh, oh, okay. and not just medicine, because uh, an apothecary pharmacy is a chemist shop historically. Sure. Uh, but they, before the war, were supplying to smaller pharmacies and hospitals around the area. So it was a, a pretty natural progression then to supply the commissary department, or the quartermaster in the early mm -hmm. years of the war, eventually the commissary department, and then those military departments would distribute the products to all of those hospitals that they had set up around the city of Alexandria. Gotcha, I think that makes sense. It's more of a kind of from the back end, like a supply mm -hmm. situation. Um, even though we, you know, we think of this as medicine, obviously, and you would potentially think it would go right to the medical department. I guess I could see um, how it might fall into the purview of quartermasters or commissaries or what have you. <laughs> um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I wondered if maybe, um, so there's obviously all kinds of you know, uh, older looking tools and things in here. I'm seeing over there some large glass vials mm -hmm. and, and things. Um, what would some of those larger glass things uh, have been used for? Is that literally just holding large amounts of liquid or medicine? And then just that's like the bulk order basically? Or Well, we have a lot of glass funnels and they would have been used for in the distillation process for mm -hmm. a lot of liquid medicines. And we have a lot of show globes in our collection mm -hmm. too. Uh, two in the windows that are actually reproduction. Sure. But we have some of the original ones over here as well. And show globes were just a common symbol for pharmacies mm -hmm. in the really 17th through mid 20th century in the United States kind of represented a big medicine bottle, but the tradition probably starts from uh, apothecaries being one of the few businesses in town that would have need of really large glass vessels for alcohols and common oils that they're using frequently to, to make medicines with. Sure, so it's like the kind of the apothecary equivalent of that, that barbershop mm -hmm. twirly swirly yep. uh, kind of symbol. Apothecaries had two. They had the mortar and pestle and right. then they also had show globes. If you right. watch old movies, sometimes you'll see a show globe in the window of the pharmacy as they're walking down the street. Mm -hmm. And really you're like, excited. oh, hey, yeah. there, there I know it what is. That is. I, <laughs> I love that. Now in terms of uh, how the, the pharmacy operated both then and maybe let's compare it to how pharmacies might operate now. And what, what's a way that uh, might surprise people that there's a similarity mm -hmm. between how this place might have operated and maybe a difference? Well, some of the similarities are just the fact that you're coming in to pick up medicine. Sure. Um, the differences are a little more obvious to me. Right. The fact that you're getting your medicine made for you mm -hmm. right on the spot for the most part. Um, Legally, you didn't need a prescription from a physician mm -hmm. back in the 19th century, mm -hmm. so that's another big difference. <laughs> sure. Uh, but a similarity that people often don't, a similarity that people aren't often aware of uh, with historic medicine is that a lot of these ingredients that they were using have found their way into modern medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, and while quinine, synchona, 
isn't widely used in the United States anymore. It's still a really common treatment for malaria in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, a direct connection mm -hmm. um, with Civil War medicine uh, and now. Yeah, so that that's fascinating. So you could have just walked into a place like this without a prescription mm -hmm. and just pointed out the walls and say, I'll have uh, some of these and yep. and there you go. You're, you're off and running. Well, that, that certainly is a difference. <laughs> Folks are coming to visit. Uh, what a, When they come through the museum here, what is it that you hope that they sort of take away from their visit here? Uh, one of our big goals for visitors is that they appreciate that while medicine seems very different today, it hasn't changed all that much mm -hmm. and that modern medicine has its roots in herbalism. There's so many sure. medicines that um, we still use today that are maybe synthetically produced, but the chemicals were discovered in plants like the quinine or um, colchicine is another great example mm -hmm. for treating gout. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and that's something we talk a lot about at the museum as well, um, drawing the line from the past to the mm -hmm. present. Uh, and modern medical science, at least as we think of it today, is, is really shockingly recent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it just, it's one of the reasons why I enjoy working at a medical museum because I think places like this at first glance can appear old and antiquated mm -hmm. and in some ways that's true but in just as many uh, ways oh. it's they're um, you know not from that long ago yeah um, yep. so I, I, I love that thank you so much for hosting us Lauren we really appreciate it yeah our pleasure and uh, definitely come out and, and check out the uh, this the Stabler Leadbeater mm -hmm. Apothecary Museum yep. Um, whenever you come through Alexandria. Uh, and until next time, this is John and Lauren signing off.